Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I just say that my slides are online, so if you also want to watch them afterwards, uh, you can see them. Uh, thank you very much for this very uh, uh, generous introduction, and especially Nadika for the invitation. Uh, it's really nice to talk in a conference dedicated to open science, and already uh, for six years, so it's, it's actually our a rarity. Even though I've been in open science for a very long time, I think I've been contributing, it's not so uh, uh, organized as you have done. So you're a pioneer and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, yeah, so fair battery will come, stay with me, uh, but I would like to actually talk first, introduce why I chose this uh, title of uh, open source hardware for the common good. And uh, I have to start by introducing what do I mean by the common good. Should I turn this on as well? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I don't know if you know Mariana Mazzucato. She's an economist in UK, you know, giving advice to, to very uh, sort of the presidents and prime ministers all over the world. Uh, and uh, she is also the author of uh, of many books, but she was also the person who said, you know, if you look at, for example, an iPhone, it's mostly based on public uh, technologies. Or if you look at a lot of uh, technologies which nowadays we think are uh, changing our world, are based on public research at the beginning, like internet. So, and then more recently, uh, she has also a lot of books about mission economy. And this was one of, one of her articles, uh, beginning of this year. Uh, it's called the common, also for the common good, where I borrowed my title from. And she says that tackling our biggest challenges and reversing the undue concentration of wealth and power will require a fundamental change in political economy. Currently, the principle of common good is seen as merely a corrective for the current excesses, but it should be the system's primary objective. And this word system is what I would like to emphasize. So I would like to actually come to the topic of open science from a system view. And also in the same article, she defines common goods. Uh, she says, common goods are the product of collective interactions and investment that requires shared ownership and governance model. And this is not something new. Maybe uh, you know there was a, a Nobel Prize of Economy to Eleanor Ostrom for the topic of commons uh, already more than a decade ago, I think 15 years ago. And she, show, she showed that actually commons is not only about sharing, but it's also about the governance of that, uh, that thing. And they were talking about postures, historical examples, things like that. But we now have data commons, creative commons. Uh, they are all under category of how are you going to run the commons. What I found interesting, even though a lot of people in the economy now appreciate the topic of common ownership and commons, somehow the connection with uh, open science has not been made. I have read many of Matsukaru's books. She never mentions open science. And the question I have to why is that? So maybe we should actually also organize a conference in the Department of Economy or Faculty of Economy. I don't know if your university has one. But that's also maybe a next frontier for open science to concur and then let them see a lot of topics they talk about are actually the same as the topic of open science. And I want to make this connection because open science is much more advanced than you think has the tools, has the infrastructure, uh, than the economy for commons. And that's, I guess, we can actually give to that discipline a lot of our tools. And that's the argument I would like to make today in the next uh, 45 minutes. So uh, the system I would like to uh, analyze and explore is the university. And it's big enough that can be an agent of change, uh, but it's also say, close enough to my heart and close enough to my circle of influence that I can, you know, go and meet the, the, the chancellor, talk to the colleagues, to the deans, and, you know, try to influence them. So it's close enough. I don't have that control on the Ministry of Economic Affairs, but I do have it at the university. And that's my area of influence and probably yours as well. And this is a talk of open. The University of Utrecht has really gone on a, high gear and uh, open. So this is the uh, slogan of our university, open minds, open attitudes, and open science. Uh, with these, we join force to create tomorrow's solution. Uh, and before 
before this was slogan, it was about better minds, better future. So it was all about improving, but this is now about really open. And this is a couple of years ago. It's a university which has been there for 400 years. This is our academy building in the center of the city where all the promotions and ceremonies take place. So it has been there for a very long time. And one can say, oh, why not create a better system? But you have to take along with them the existing systems because they are there and they will be there you know, after we go. So it's good to actually have an influence. I have not given up on the organization of the university. So you haven't as well, I think. And there are three core activities which I would like to analyze in the relation with open science. Uh, research, number one, everybody nowadays approves that. You know, research universities are the modern thing. Education, depends where you are. For the research universities, at least at the researcher level, education had a backseat for a long while, but for many universities, education is the main reason to exist, so they appreciate that. If there is a comeback for education uh, in North Europe, in North America, for example, uh, research universities are acknowledging that education is one of their core ta uh, tasks, and that you can see in sort of the uh, evolvement of the career uh, prospects of people. So there are people who specialize in teaching and make a full career in teaching even inside the research university. So if it has a comeback, I would like to have some words about education and what to educate on open science. And there's knowledge transfer, uh, tech transfer, maybe if you are in technical faculty. It has very different names. It has impact, valorization, depends where you go. Uh, and I will also talk, come back to it as well, because even though this is an area at the core of open science, it's only recently that we are uh, talking about open science and knowledge transfer in a, uh, in a bold fashion. So I want to come back to these three topics. Research. I, I can talk a lot about it, but I think this is a topic which a lot has been said about it, uh, because research is the place that open science sort of, sort of caught, caught fire with the open access, starting from research output, the fact that you need to have reproducible output, otherwise you don't do good science. And this was very clear like uh, 10, 15 years ago when the reproducibility crisis hit the news. Uh, people from, you know, people who do medical research found out 80% of the drugs are not really effective. In psychology, we had a lot of scandals. So uh, reproducibility became the, the, the core value that everybody was striving for. In Netherlands, we also had a couple of very world famous scandals, unfortunately, in psychology. So with my colleagues uh, who are running the open, science, uh, open hardware community at Delft and Vittorio Sajomo at uh, Wageningen, we looked at sort of the influence of open hardware for research and we recognized five elements, which doesn't come very surprising. Of course, the first one is reproducibility. And here I'm focusing on open hardware as a means of producing. Of course, when people talk about reproducibility, a lot of time we think about data to be shared, but that only works for digital products. If you want to reproduce an experiment, you cannot do it based on the methods section alone. You need the equipment to do that. And you can say not everybody can have a synchrotron or a particle accelerator, but a lot of people can have microscopes, so why not share that? And because the hardware is getting uh, more affordable, more accessible, sharing the recipes of hardware, there is no reason against it. And that is re really needed for reproducibility of science. So this open hardware part is part of the reproducibility. Of course, it fosters collaboration because, you know, no experiment is done without, without tools, at least not in my field or many of your engineering fields. So if you have the tools, you can collaborate. So this is good for the science as, as a meta level. It helps the accessibility of your, your uh, research because if more people have access to the labs or production of those uh, tools from the lab, they can actually do this experiment. So your research will be used much more and much further places. Uh, Vittorio Sajomo, my colleague, he says, you know, I have this matchbox microscope and even before I even submit the publication, I have like 200 people in the world who copy my uh, device. Not in a bad form, it's in a good form. He's very happy about it because they started using it and they help him improve in his design so that when he's publishing, he publishes something which already has been tested 200 times or even more. It, it also makes innovation for many reasons. 
I think for people who have tried to make open hardware, they know that uh, they have to be very creative. I, I see a lot of creativity already here in these devices. And th this is partly because of the boundary conditions that you put on, on your condition. If you want to make something open, the, uh, you cannot just buy it on the shelf. You have to be very creative. And if you give it to other people, you uh, sort of peek into their minds and make the innovation of your uh, products uh, go higher. And you can customize. That's especially important for scientific hardware because uh, most of the science that you can do with the devices on the shelf is pre probably boring uh, or very dedicated uh, experiments. Of course, MRIs you need for doing experiments, but many other tools you need for new uh, uh, experiments you have to customize to be able to call it a new uh, experiment. So customization also is one of the properties of open hardware. Uh, Joshua Pierce, uh, he's a very well-known figure in, uh, in uh, open source uh, hardware. He has a couple of books and he recently, well, maybe a few years ago, moved his, his lab from one uh, university to, the, uh, to Canada. And he said, you know, I stopped buying it. I just said, these are the equipment I want in my lab. Five PhD students, 10 PhD, these are the equipment you need to make. They all started making it so we at you know, one hundredth of the cost that we could buy them, we just made everything we need. And it was very nice because actually pandemic hit their move, but everybody was doing the experiments uh, at the lab, at the home. So, so they actually were not delayed because of the lab closure. I have recorded a podcast with Joshua. He explains this uh, in his own words very well. And it's actually much easier nowadays because if you do open source hardware, you can officially publish it in journals with impact factor or whatever matters for you. It has a very robust peer review system. You can, you can just, it counts like any normal publication. So it's uh, on top of what you achieve by making your experiments more accessible. You can even just get in the classical firm uh, the credit for it. Okay, now. Number two is teaching. And in open science, most of the time when people talk about teaching, they talk about open education or open educational resources, which is a very, very important field. It's one of the sort of origins of uh, open science uh, to share your you know, lecture notes, your exercises, but also educational material. Because not everybody, every professor in the world has to rewrite it on the mechanics lecture notes, right? Why not share? And I, I really appreciate it. But I think there is enough, or not enough, there is a lot has been said by people who know uh, open education resources much more than me. So I would like to focus on a different part of teaching open science, and that's something I recently experimented with in my course. I have a course together with Eric van Sebi, a, a colleague of mine in the Metrology Institute of our department. Uh, we have designed a course called Open Science for Physicists. And we were warned, you know, physics students want to hear about quantum mechanics and field theory and uh, talking about open science will, uh, will bore them. And, well, we dare to put some material in it and it actually worked. That's why I'm so happy about it, I would like to share with you. And that is about teaching how science works. And this is something we sort of get by default from the old system because it's a sort of mentor-mentee relation. So many teachers, professors say to students, you know, do what I did and you'll be fine. Uh, and what I did is just from the cover of it. It's not actually what actually in, the, in, in, in real life happens. So teaching how science works is something which is somehow being left out of the curriculum of the science faculty. And we tested it. I very briefly mentioned this in my class, but at the end we had a, we had a survey and you know, half the class said, oh, this is a topic I enjoyed the most. And I'm now going to explain this. Uh, this. this is a book of uh, Bruno Latour. It was an anthropologist and sociologist, a French one. Anybody knows Bruno Latour? That's fine. He's fine. He's, uh, he's not from engineering background, but he was a great uh, philosopher and anthropologist. And in the 1980s, he, uh, I think he was a young scientist, young scholar, I must say, he went to the Salk Institute in the United States to do anthropology of scientists. So he studied scientists in that lab as if studying, you know, creatures or people, Aboriginal people, or studying 
you know, indigenous people in Amazons. Uh, so he just looked at the relation between them, who says what, who reacts how to the other person. Uh, and he wrote this book uh, together with uh, Steve Volgar, which is called The Laboratory Life. So how life happens in a laboratory. And it was a very technical laboratory. They were doing, uh, I don't know, antibodies, proteins, discovering, uh, I don't know, vaccines. I actually don't know what were the topic of them. Excuse me for that. But he wrote this very, very nice book, which is uh, known very much in the philosophy circles and for the interested in philosophy, but not a lot actually in the other side of science. And uh, what he recognized in the lab from the interactions of the people uh, was against the idea of the time, because for a long time, um, people were explaining science as a pursuit, pursuit of truth. So there is this grand truth or grand discovery, big questions of life, uh, and everybody's after that. So it's sort of outside the scientists. And as anthropologists, he observed and he said, no, it's not at all about that. What topic we research is about our interactions. And he actually, I think the first, the first who identified what is called the cycle of credibility. And this is how science works in the view of Bruno Latour and many others. And I, I have to take you through it. It goes counterclockwise. He was not an engineer. You know. So it starts from recognition. So you would like to be recognized. You give talks. Uh, you, you go to the laboratories. You start in engaging discussions. Uh, ask clever questions for the professors, for the people who already have some credit to share that credit with you. So it starts with recognition. Then you would like to you know, use that recognition to get resources. It's a scholarship, it's a grant, something that allows you to, you know, live another year and uh, continue your research. Some people spend that money on buying equipment and then use that equipment to gather more data that the other people don't have, then connect that data with some analysis. They come up with arguments, uh, then present these arguments to the rest of the world. They call it articles and hopefully other people read it. And then by reading some new results, other people will give you more credits and you can write the next grant, the next proposal. And that's why he called it this cycle of credibility. In his view, that was how actually science was working. It was a connection of human relations for every person. And most people, you know, one cycle you get your PhD or four of them, I don't know, it depends the rules of university, the next one you get promoted, 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 you become professor at some point. You have to just go through this cycle. That's what uh, Bruno said. And this was a discussion about is it science something out of us or something in our relation. But actually it was used, and to my knowledge, Frank Miedema, who was the dean of the medical faculty in our university, was the person who showed it to me about 10 years ago and has a book about it, it's called Open Science, The Very Idea. He used this cycle of credibility to recognize how actually, what was the problem with reproducibility of science. So in other words, how science breaks. And uh, these are the ideas, sort of these are the things that he recognized in the cycle. For example, I mean, the first thing is that in this cycle, it's about scientists and interacting with other scientists. Society is not even there, right? Unlike what we try to pay to the taxpayer the science good comes, the cycle of credibility in reality is about scientists to proving other, to other scientists how cool they are, how smart they are, that they need a bigger pie of the uh, bigger share of the pie, for example. So that's the sort of the at the very high level that's the problem with the cycle. But then of course when it comes to the money, stuff, and equipment, there is of course more and more scientists and less and less money and more expensive experiments. So there is a hyper competition. Uh, there are limited funds. There are always, you know, these proposal rounds that uh, half the excellent proposals, rated really excellent, cannot get the money. So, and you don't know if the other half are necessarily the best. Uh, it works against collaboration. So, team science is really a victim of this uh, uh, hyper competition, and it also works against diversity of research. So, women diversity because the biases come into the competition is one effect of it but also to collaborate with the people from other faculty is a bad thing because if you start collaborating with the philosophers on a project, probably the other scientists don't understand what you have done, so they rate it less and this is against, uh, against your personal will. 
then there is also about the data and arguments. First of all, the data are not shared. I mean, just objectively, you can show that the quality of the science goes down when they are not shared. And also many people, many papers people cannot read. So the initial part that it's about sharing is also does not fulfilled. And even when you made them accessible and we try to sort of find up subjective ways of objective ways of quality control, then there are these measures of impact factors which proven time after time after time that they are just bad measures. They are game, they don't work. Uh, they're wrong, they, uh, they are just showing the wrong things. So it's not even a good quality control. Uh, uh, it's a bit like, you know, you go to a supermarket and just assume that whatever is more expensive has a better quality. And of course, that is a recipe for everybody to make it more expensive. Or whatever has the shiniest package, independent of what's inside, is better quality. This is what a, a bad measure uh, does. So this is the identification of Frank Miedema, and I think many people share this, that even at this individual credibility cycle, this is somehow broken because the system has reached a limit. So I just like to uh, call this uh, the egocentric uh, view of science. It's about how one person sort of goes around the cycle. And these are the problems with the cycle of credibility at the moment. Of course, it has created a hyper competition. Uh, it has projectified our science, you know. Science has to be fit into projects of two, three years. So a 10-year project is probably not going to be uh, easily granted. So it's, and also after four years, you find something you cannot continue because you have to do something new. So you just lose it, uh, all, the, all the things that you uh, identified, you have to put on the side and come something with the new. So progress of science is actually stalled. It's also very inefficient because uh, we did a calculation in the Netherlands. If you know, we take four hours, sorry, four weeks to write a proposal, and the grant proposal uh, has 10% success rate, 15%, which is not. This is what the case it is now. Just by having this competition, because of all the time that you get from the scientists to write this proposal, you actually take money from the system away because most people write proposals which will be rejected. Uh, and a few of them will get it, but it will cost the system much more than the money that you're distributing. But there is also one more thing which I would like to emphasize, and that's what resonates with the students and also very colleagues, which don't believe the cycle of credibility because it's no more even reflects the reality. And I, I tell you why, I mean, most people even cannot recognize as a single circle. It's just much more complicated. And that's because it's, I think, more modern thing and that's because I think nowadays we are talking not about the cycle of credibility which we walk, but a network of credibility. We are part of different projects, different networks. I go to physics conference, but I also go to open science conference, and my colleagues go to biology conference at the same time they go, I don't know, to robotics conference. It's a network, and then you have uh, private investors. You can, you know, use the instruments of Google and uh, Facebook, but you can also have public uh, money involved, so this is connected to each other. How you're thriving is not even dependent on one system. You are no more supposed to only convince uh, the professor to get a good recommendation. You also have to convince the, uh, the people in the engineering department of another company because they could be your potential future uh, employer, or you have to convince the public because it's very important to have public engagement. So you, you interact with a very complex knowledge development network. You also use a lot of things, you know. If you know people who are very good at AI, uh, they can help your experiments and you can use their tools. So you have to spend time to find out which tool among all these sort of AI tools is most useful for your experiment. And your friends can help you if they are generous enough. So generosity becomes part of, <laughs> part of the scientific endeavor. And this is what makes actually the credibility cycle not even a good measure in, in my view anymore because you have to interact with the network and it's not just a linear cycle that you just go one two three times and you get promoted it depends how how bold you are in your this node you might write you know very simple package in your phd which is not related even to the topic of your phd and become you know world famous for that get the best uh, contracts from google and dropbox and uh, that package might be Python. Guido van Rossum famously wrote Python uh, between Christmas and the New Year uh, in the CWI uh, Institute in Amsterdam. 
uh, and he's now paid by Dropbox half the time he works for Dropbox, the other half just is the benevolent dictator of Python. So now that's why the teaching of how science works brings new things that we have to teach or we have to even discuss because I'm not sure even that the professors know how to thrive in a credibility network. Uh, but one of the observations I have, this is called rule number one of a, a credibility network is that in a network interactions matter as much as the achievements. So it's very important to show that you have the brilliant idea but also it's very important to connect it to the, to the right people, to present it in the right fora, to uh, show it to the right uh, influential people for example, and also be recognized by those. So it's no more sufficient that you got the best recommendation from your professor and you get a good job. This is not gonna, uh, how things work anymore. Some people think it is how it is working, but it's not. I get you know, hundreds of applications and all of them have excellent recommendations and I have only one position to, to offer. So you need to show other ways of uh, your credibility to the network and it's not only interpersonal relation with a small group or even just your community. And that's where it makes it, for some people who are Maybe introverts is a bad term because it's not really a characteristic trait, but for some people who are used to the old system, this is, is an extra burden. Oh, now I have to also socialize, or now I have to uh, present my work. Yeah, well. But for other people, it's, 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 a, it's a welcome thing, and some very successful organizations, Open Science, have actually invested in it. So if you go to Apache, which is, you know, Apache Software Foundation, they have a lot of very successful projects. They say community over code. So it's very important, if the code breaks, it's fine, we can fix it. But if the community breaks, we have to close the shop. And that's what uh, they have come up. And these are you know, a community of nerds, uh, actually, very, very hardcore uh, technical people. But even they have understood that they have to talk gently with each other, they have to respect each other's limit, they have to respect each other's time, uh, they have to have a good communication channel. So, and when you think about community interactions and this uh, service of Mozilla I would like to present here, there is much more than just credit going around in form of money, who employs who or who supports who. There's a lot of more uh, of types of interactions that you can have in a network uh, than just exchange of money. Uh, this is a very simple version of exchange. And Mozilla has, uh, in, uh, I really opened my eyes seven years ago when I did the uh, the open leadership uh, course of Mozilla and this is a, uh, these are some of the interactions that they have identified from their observation of the software community. Uh, interaction can be gifting, you know, you do something for somebody and then that person does it, uh, something else for you back. You can create together without even, you know, trying to some, employ somebody or motivate somebody or invite somebody to your lab, you can create together uh, a piece of software or a piece of hardware. Uh, you can encourage other people to learn through using your products but also learn from them because they are using your products as early adopters. Uh, you can also just network common interests. You know? I'm interested in biosensing and you're interested in signal processing or you're interested in, in other things. If you find a common interest together we can do a bigger project. So these are the parts that result in going towards common platform, shared platform and open hardware platforms. These are all coming from these common interests. That's why Arduino who started from a design school, uh, the design in Italy has become such an instrumental uh, tool for, for science. And that's from the Turing way, there's a, there's a book written collaboratively, uh, I really recommend it because when I talk about it, you say this is, this guy is talking in the air, in the clouds, there are many people talking about it, they have documented it, they have written books about it, maybe it's not a textbook but it's a very good book and there is a chapter about collaboration and there you can learn from the basics of how to set up your GitHub and how to set up code of conduct or how to uh, you know, make it project management all the way to you know, inclusive workspaces, exchanges, things like that. So there is a lot of technical, I call it here, technical know-how about uh, how to collaborate. And this comes now from, many of them comes from companies but also NGOs or, uh, or successful projects. And here is the thing which makes a very big difference. I call this the golden rule. Uh, and this is an insight from uh, evolutionary uh, sociology, but also from mathematics. And it's very well summarized in this sentence of uh, 
uh, David Sloan Wilson, who is an evolutionary psychologist, and he has, in his book, Does Altruism Exist? He says, uh, this, the, 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 average, the, the message of my book is, selfishness builds altruism within groups, and altruistic groups beat selfish groups. I will explain. And he has another sentence, the rest is just commentary. The rest is just explanation of it. What this means, and this is an insight from studying social herds. So they have studied animals, for example. You can have primates, you know, different types of monkeys or primates. They are, some of them are very competitive, and some of them are uh, very collaborative. And then you can see, if you have a common field, which group wins. You can do that with, with other animals, herds, for example. But you can also do that with bacteria. There is a lot of research on different types of bacteria, even within the bacteria. And you can see if there are bacteria which have to collaborate to get food or protect themselves. And how is it when you have other bacteria which are very competitive? You know, they compete around resources. And this is what is coming out of that research. That if you are looking at the group level, those groups, which there is a lot of collaboration inside them, eventually evolutionary win over those groups, those bacteria, for example, where there is a lot of internal competition. And this is actually has a mathematical proof as well. So this is, you probably have heard about the prisoner's dilemma. When, so if you actually expand the hypothesis of prisoner's dilemma to the group, about a big group of people who have trusted each other in comparison with a group of people who don't trust, you can even mathematically prove that there is an advantage for the you know, collaborative group in a game theory sense of uh, thing to win about the other. So this is a you know, very robust conclusion. But well, what does it say? Uh, uh, what has it to do with open science? When it comes to open science, one of the problems, or maybe not a problem, but of the luxuries, is that you have a lot of choice. If you go you know, to the internet, online, you have thousands of uh, projects to collaborate. Where to start? There are, I don't know, thousands of versions of Linux uh, lightweight you can search for. And one of the places that you can start, and that is something to teach, that's why I put it in teaching, to start to see how good the community is for. This you can learn from the documentation, this you can learn from the interactions in that group, from their conferences. And of course, as a person who wants to enter, this gives you a very big competitive advantage. If you want to work on a project that lasts longer than yourself or becomes bigger than yourself, it's better to work with a project which is full of altruistic people. And that's, I think, many open source communities or open science projects have understood this. They try to make very inviting uh, uh, environments uh, to, to be able to, to attract the best talent. So this is a golden rule. We don't think about it as important, but this is really important career choice for whoever wants to work in open science. Now, I come back to where I started, the sentence of Mariano Mazzucato. Common goods are the product of collective interactions and investment that requires shared ownership and governance model. And these are all the things we are talking about in open science. And we are talking about it very systemically for a very long time. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Bianca Kramer and Jeroen Bosman, actually identified the infrastructure which is set up for collaboration in open science. And this goes all the way. And this is already 10 years old and still very good resource. I think they keep it up to date. So all the way from grant proposals, the starting grant proposals, using references from different libraries, citations, sharing code, sharing lab equipment, sharing notebooks, all the way to the final part of assessment and public engagement, open science community has created tools that everybody can use. So there's a framework, a systematic framework, and one needs to learn about these things. Most students actually don't know about it. And that's why, after lecture one, which we talk about how science works and breaks, we talk about how to work with GitHub. This is a full section, full lecture uh, in my course, because uh, it's very different to work on a GitHub and collaborate than work in a, in a department which you see people face to face. And well, students have to learn about it. Okay. Do I get questions now, or shall I go all the way to the end? Yeah? Fine. Uh, look at the time. Yeah, okay, now I'm, I'm right uh, where I wanted to be. So third topic, knowledge transfer. And knowledge transfer has sort of a comeback. Many places call it tech transfer still. I'll tell you why it has become from tech to knowledge uh, very soon. 
it had to come back because you know after the the war research university just had a boom right in a lot they become 10 times bigger than they were because well science could you know be on the winning side of the war so they had you know a lot of vannevar bush doctoring that just give us money we will do research and someday uh, it we will pay back so it had expanded based on research. Research becomes the primary uh, way of growing among the universities. And then after a while, of course, all this time they had to do teaching, but because it was sort of uh, undercared kid, uh, students were not happy with the attention that the professors were paying to the teaching. So teaching had to be revived. And so after a while, if I remember that people started to say that instead of research universities, say the core activity of universities, research, and teaching. And it's all about the, the rich universities. Of course, for not so rich universities, teaching was always the primary goal. And it's about maybe 10, 15 years, or maybe more, 30 years, that because the economic affairs is also uh, involved in the direction of the university, and uh, maybe my analysis is not complete, but that's where I see it from, from one side. At some point, I remember, our institute director when I was a PhD came say we need more patents because they say you don't do valorize enough so I'm going to give a bonus to everybody who uh, sort of files an uh, invention disclosure I got one of those which was funny so knowledge transfer or tech transfer valorization becomes also primary objective of the university and possibly because university is just too expensive uh, I don't know why but I just want to say this is not new this is a comeback because knowledge transfer was always there for science. And I chose this painting. The painting is not very old, from 2012 uh, by Rita Gree, but it is a scene explained where uh, uh, Robert Hooke from the Hooke's Law Spring and also a lot of uh, gas uh, research. Robert Hooke is in a cafe and explaining science to the public. And this was his job for the Royal Society. His task at the Royal Society was to go to the pubs or to the cafes, uh, coffee house in, in British they call it, and explain science to people. I couldn't find a reference, but I read somewhere that he even actually used to cook for people uh, himself. And I think that's the guy. He also sometimes went there and used the, the people to test his uh, ideas, hypotheses. Uh, so public engagement is a very old thing for science. It has, it has never always been a pure royal thing. One has to talk to the people uh, to, for the science to thrive and go forward. But more modern way of technology transfer still is, uh, in US has a different cycle. And I think this is called the technology transfer life cycle. I took it from the, uh, I think it's called Association of the University Technology Management in the United States. This is their uh, annual uh, report. This one is from before the pandemic. This one is after the pandemic. Not, not much has changed, uh, unlike what I expected. Uh, this is what they say technology transfer is. So you start with, uh, with inventions, disclosures, you know, people invent things from their research. There is somebody who evaluates, is it worthwhile to pursue further because it will cost money if you want to file a patent or protect it. But if it is worthwhile, have potential, you need to do IP protection. Hopefully you have to find other people with deep pockets or investors to uh, give you some money uh, to make real use of it because the patent will cure nobody, you need to turn it into product. Uh, so you do it via licensing. Uh, and as you see, the numbers are also reducing as you go around the cycle. And then the company still has to, I don't know, maybe do 10 times the original research to make this sort of idea into some product, uh, which you know people, you can trust it or you can send it to FDA to get approval. And hopefully the product will go to the market, will be used by the public, will create a lot of economic value and part of it also goes back to the university uh, through this license agreement, but also part of it just becomes you know, jobs and uh, startups, things like that. So this is the idea of uh, technology transfer, a common idea from North America, also have been imported at least to uh, Netherlands, I can tell, but maybe other places. Uh, this is how things should work. It's called still technology transfer in many universities. Uh, this has changed in Netherlands many places to knowledge transfer because universities also have the faculties of humanities and social sciences and if you have you know one very expensive section of the university only serving the faculty of engineering 
well, the other faculties are not always very supportive, so they said, you know, technology is not the only thing we transfer, but also knowledge we transfer. And it can be books, it can be uh, other social impactful things, so they are calling it knowledge transfer, or KTOs. Well, I, I mean, I think a lot of uh, uh, mathematically minded people here, this, and you know about the graphs, which are not really what they are. Uh, they, they don't share. I just use the ratios of the numbers, and if you go around it, you, go, you get a ratio of about 3%. So 3% of the ideas eventually turn into products or startups. So if you really want to uh, plot it uh, <laughs> scientifically and in a faithful way, this is the, the, the plot. It's a leaky pipeline. So you have a lot of inventions. Some of them get IP protection. Some of them are marketed, less of them licensed, and only a very few. But I think that the good number is 1%, but in the numbers of the Americans are 3%. And this is already only about the ideas which turn into an invention disclosure. And we have many ideas that the universities even don't become an invention disclosure. So it is a, it is a very generous uh, uh, representation of reality. Uh, and I'm not the only one who mentions that. I mean, there is this reper recent report by uh, the GOSH policy briefs. Uh, Juliet Arantz and Jenny Molai also have a very nice uh, uh, investigation of uh, who is served by the knowledge transfer offices. So, and that's why I call what the knowledge transfer office is doing is serving the 1% quarter. And I'm using it in a sort of a, a judgmental way. It's just 1% of the people who want to transfer their knowledge or supposed to transfer knowledge get the service from the knowledge transfer office. Just the graph, you know, hard numbers. And this is here because they want to be exclusive and most of the time there has to be niche. They have to be prospect of the, you know, future expansion. For them it's a logic is that already this 1% eventually will become the next Google so it pays off for the rest. I don't know if any of the university knowledge transfer offices even makes the claim that we are net cash positive. Even MIT and Harvard, they are cash negative. They get the money and they have to use other factors to show that uh, they are giving a positive uh, impact. But anyway, just based on the number of people that they served during the whole process, I call this a 1% quarter. And I came with this knowledge compass or knowledge utilization compass by just looking at what is very special about this 1% quarter. They, use, they have to be exclusive because of the legal roots, because nobody wants to license something completely uh, in the open. And they are usually very niche because uh, you would like to create a market uh, in the future or a very special product. So it has to have much more added value in the future than it has now. And if I just extend this to access, that's what I get. Uh, and I guess if you, ex except for niche, you have things of broad use, and on the other side of exclusive products, you have shared ownership products. Products that are nobody's sort of main ownership, nobody can say this is mine, it's shared. And somehow, accidentally, I would say, not so surprisingly, this is what the area I call the commons quarter, which you have a lot of broad use, a lot of users, uh, and you need to have shared ownership, almost by definition. Fine, what are the other two areas? You know, if you saw, do this uh, extrapolation, you have to get uh, other areas. So I just generated these names for the other two areas, the anarchist quarter. These are the areas that are very niche, but people insist on shared ownership. Some open source products are like that, libertarians, things like that. So I call this the anarchist quarter. Right? Uh, it's nothing against, it's not a value judgment. I can actually imagine myself in either of these quarter working. I, I, I'm happy here, I do have patents, I do have spin-offs. I'm happy here, I can be happy here. And there's also the conqueror's quarter. These are the, you know, this is, these are the type of people who would like to have something which is the next, you know, uh, handkerchief or the next cool thing that everybody wants to have, the next iPhone, but they would like to keep it exclusive to themselves. So. Uh, I call them the conqueror's attitude or conqueror's quarter. Uh, I think for the universities, these two quarters don't matter much because this quarter, these people don't like universities. You know, these are the, the people who just, you know, uh, get out of the program in the first year. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes, things like that, you know, university, Bill Gates. They stop because the university is a barrier for them. So they don't come to the knowledge transfer office usually. And these people uh, are not really liked by the university, right? They are 
not organized, don't come to the classes, they probably fail. So I think we are mostly talking about these two, the 1% cohort and the commerce cohort. So, and now you can say, well, there are a lot of nice words, but yeah, university has to show that it's a value. Yes, that's true, and I agree that the university has to show some value, but this is not such a common perception. This is one of the few things that actually the people working at the university find, uh, want to do. So my colleague Yuri uh, Tiding, they did some research uh, across a lot of uh, uh, other scholars, professors, what are the roles of the university, and they found these six that they, there was consensus on. And the first one was to foster research integrity, to, pr to have something which is trustable. Uh, you would like also to, to uh, stimulate in, uh, development of intellectual vir virtues, uh, to address big questions of life. This has always been a, uh, an attractive thing for the university people. Uh, to cultivate the diversity of disciplinary fields, so that's why people in engineering all, all know us uh, agree also that the social sciences and philosophy is also part of university. Uh, to serve the society at large, this is very important uh, for the commons quarter, and uh, to safeguard and cultivate academic freedom. That's connected to the sixth one. So people at the university want it. So there are many people who would like to work in the commons quarter. Um, it's very good, it's very, I think, legitimate to expect for the knowledge transfer office to serve these people as well. So here's my solution. Uh, it's called it Open Science Handshake. It's maybe naive, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but I would say, you know, just keep the same process, just let it go as it is. But each time somebody wants to go out as an exit, uh, sometimes it's by force, sometimes people are tired, sometimes they got a new job, each time people fall out of this process, offer them this open science handshake. Say, you know, you have done a great job, you have written a business model, you have worked you know, on your prototypes, you have done uh, even interviews with companies. All the things you have done are very valuable. If you stop now uh, and don't make a company uh, out of it or don't go all the way, you will get no return. Maybe that's not what you want, but here is a very small token of appreciation, you know, a few months of salary or some, some small uh, resource. Uh, just make it open source, you know, dedicated to the common. And that is possible. There are very good legal recipes for, uh, from the Creative Commons licensing. Whatever you have produced, which you do not want to pursue further to a spin-off or uh, scale-up, just donate it to the Creative Commons and the university will support you. And I think this is in line with what the university really wants. And by doing that, eventually, not only the 1% are served, but you're also serving the 99% or the comments by giving to the comments. Of course, I understand the math is going to be very expensive because even though there is a small appreciation for any of these uh, uh, contracts, there are many of those, so it can become very expensive uh, if you scale it. Well, I leave that to the university to decide. Uh, but it's not all about money, and this maybe brings the, this dialogue from the uh, Oscar Wilde book, uh, Lady Windermere's Fan, uh, and the dialogue uh, is in the scene, says, what is a cynic? And uh, the answer is a man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And the answer is, and a sentimental, my dear Darlington, is a man who sees an absurd value in everything and doesn't know the market price of a single thing. Well, maybe I'm a sentimentalist, but I don't know. I think many, many... Uh, colleagues at the university are also. Uh, I have found maybe a way of breaking this thing that, oh, then I have to give a lot of money to everyone and with a lot of use. There are certain areas of technology, and now I'm coming to fair battery finally, <laughs> that is actually fertile for commoning. And I have found, I, I, I grew for five criteria. And most of these technology are related to somehow to the planetary emergencies we have, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, and many other crises that we are living in it, democratic crisis also, but only living on these sort of boundaries. I would say actually these are the technologies are not actually super good for that very long uh, trajectory for reasons which I say. The first thing is urgency. So that cycle that I showed you on average takes 25 years, 20 years. And we don't have that much time. 2030 is only seven years from now, and we need to you know, scale up technologies like MAD. So there is a great urgency. And this we saw also in the pandemic. I mean, for the vaccines, there was a lot of uh, uh, 
complaints about them become not being shared wide enough, or the same for the test. So then people said, yeah, it's urgent, so I'm going to sort of break the habit and then share it openly. So urgency is number one, and most technologies related to sustainability are urgently needed. The other one is demands actually exceed supply. So for renewable energy, there is much more demand now than, uh, uh, than you can supply everywhere in the world. Uh, it depends on how you, you, you see it, but of course we have a lot of production, but about storage, about heating, about heating the rooms. We had last year the, the gas price increase. You know, this is, there is a lot of demand for, for sustainable uh, living uh, conditions, including energy and uh, food. So when there is a lot of demand, there is no argument of, you know, we have to wait five years, 20 years, and we need a deep pocket to be a patient, uh, patient capital, things like that. You don't need, if you can't produce twice tomorrow, you get more. So crowd, crowdfunding just works as well as uh, finding a deep pocket investor. Most of these technologies are actually not so complex, but they need to be scaled up very fast, and the scaling up is make it, makes it very complex. So. You know, if you want to get rid of diesel cars, you need to replace a billion cars. Right? This is such a fast scale. And it took Tesla, I don't know, 15 years to create a million Tesla. So billion is still 1,000 times a million. Or, uh, you know, just count about heating, right? We have in the world maybe 5 billion diesel tanks used for warming uh, houses. And in 20 years, they have all to be replaced with batteries. We don't have no company who says, I can make a billion batteries in 10 years. I've talked to them, say, can you do that? Wow, I don't know, show me the money. Uh, well, immature products, many of them are actually not even mature. You cannot put a bet on it and you can say lithium, ah, but in two years comes you know, sodium, in two years comes another technology. So no, uh, you know, no investor worth his name will put so much money on a totally mature technology within two years will be out of it. And actually that's why one of the reasons, that's number five, that's why all the research and development is actually public money. 90%, 95% of the money is went to sort of sustainable technologies and renewable technologies are from public purse. So one other reason to, to go for the commons route. This is the example I uh, initiated with a couple of friends uh, and colleagues from uh, Wageningen and Eindhoven. We call this a fair battery, and then the idea is actually how can you make batteries with low cost, but also locally available materials, so you can actually do distributed manufacturing. Lithium was immediately not the answer, so we went for uh, redox flow batteries because there are many materials you can use on a shared platform. And you also have to educate people. If you cannot educate the people who can fix your technology, you better not actually send it to the places because it would be much more expensive for those people to you know, fly you there to repair uh, your batteries. And there are many, many examples of these technologies made for, uh, for, for example, uh, rural areas which are used not at all because they are not adapted to the local uh, conditions. A colleague of mine, uh, Martin Force, who actually studies electrification in sub-Saharan Africa, tells me, you know, the first year the batteries are working, everything is fine from the next year, it's just back to usual. The clinic is closed. The vaccines are rotten. So it, it, it is as if we haven't even brought electricity to the mini-grid. I'm not the only one. There are many more projects. I invite you to actually study them. Uh, I think the most successful one, or not the most, one of the successful ones is this Open EVSE. This is a technology based on Arduino for charging cars. And this revolutionized the charging stations in Europe because before that, every car had its own system and they were not sort of uh, complementary. They were not compatible with each other. Uh, and then this sort of, these two Americans made it based on Arduino. And I think most of the charging stations now, they actually use this platform. So it's economically even uh, better. Uh, and there are many others. I was last two days in a conference in Berlin. And we collected a series of uh, technologies which are actually related to that, and they're open source, and I, I think they will really scale up uh, very quickly. Uh, Apropedia and Lowtech Lab are just older examples. They are very big collections of such technologies. Uh, we also, in the Netherlands, as I said, we wrote a report how we can actually make an ecosystem which starts with the research, but also at the end also serves the research and the society at the same time. I invite you to read it. We have identified a set of actions for immediate future, but also for the long term. OK, now I'm trying to wrap up. I think I, I'm gone a bit out of time. So we had the three factors, and I just took one uh, take-home message for each, just you know, because I talked a lot. 
for research, if there are no tools for research, there is no reproducibility. So for uh, many big areas of science, open hardware is part of open science. For teaching, don't teach only about uh, material which is open, but also about how material is developed and how science works in general to create more open materials. And also to create more satisfaction. You know, if you teach people things which are actually <laughs> in reality happening, they will be more satisfied when they go out of school. And for technology transfer, you do need a diversity of services. And you know, IP and licensing is just one service which only works for a very uh, thin, major, thin minority of technologies which are created at the university. There are, of course, barriers. Uh, well, university is huge, uh, you know, container ship. It's very difficult to turn it. There is a lot of containers. There is a lot of memory. There is a lot of resistance. Uh, so conservatism is, of course, a barrier at the university, but it also can be a good thing. If you can manage to move it a little bit, it would be very difficult to move it back. So, uh, you know, celebrate your small wins all the time. Your conferences who uh, last for six years, this is a big celebration. Cynicism in the sense that Oscar Wilde said, uh, said that, of course, you should not be cynical, but also to put a monetary value on everything uh, is not really uh, something that fits to the purpose of science, definitely not open science. And also on the other side, perfectionism is also uh, not a good thing. A lot of things in open science are not perfect, but also a lot of things in closed science are not perfect. If you wait for everything to be perfect to adopt it, it will be way too late. So we shouldn't be so picky at everything. Uh, in one sentence, conclusion, mathematically two sentences, open source hardware is part of open science and open science is the common good. So they are very connected to each other. And uh, with that, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Sally, for this interesting speech. It was really inspiring. And I will call the audience. Are there any questions? So, yeah, thank course. you for your presentation. Milica Ševkušić, librarian and open science facilitator, and Blanka and Jerung happen to be my colleagues as well. Uh, so I, I agree with everything you said, and all about uh, collaboration, and about sharing, and about uh, altruism, that's all natural to me. And this is partly a question, both for you and both for the Dean. Because you com you're coming from a university that has a really well-developed policy, a really good tradition of uh, supporting open science, and uh, also uh, a kind of a pioneer in many areas. And I would like to ask uh, whether your research and, and uh, what you, you're telling now today to us would be different if, uh, if it weren't the university policy would it be much more difficult or not? And how important the policies are? Because in Serbia, we have quite many young people. Engineering is a thriving discipline. But uh, very, very few, if any of them, end up in open so science, open source projects. Open source is something that is not actively promoted. Everything is about industry, about monetary value. Uh, although we have quite many, and we'll be, we'll be talking about this in a, in a pa on an online panel la uh, next week, many people who end up in this uh, pursuing monetary value, they actually end up dissatisfied, and there is a kind of dropout. There are kind of failed careers even there, but nobody's talking about it. They're just talking about not having money in open source. So I would like to ask this about the, the policy and to share some thoughts about the importance of it. Yeah. Well, that's a very big question. Thank you. If I can translate. So I guess what I take from the question is that how much the fact that the university has been so embracing for the open science at Utrecht had uh, an effect of the things I just saying. Uh, I have to be very, <laughs> I don't want to put anybody in the spotlight also at my university, but you think it's rosy from outside, but from inside it's, it's almost the same, maybe two years ahead, two years back. The fact, of course, the support from the higher management is very important. And we do, I appreciate, and we do have a lot of support with the upper management of our university. But it doesn't mean that, that the workflow uh, is all, uh, you know, rosy and everybody appreciates it. 
uh, contrary. So uh, it has been a lot of fight for us to even get this course of open science uh, and say, oh, seven EC is too much, do it three. There's one part of it. Uh, many people still don't believe in it, right? Even they give their lip service to it. Uh, they try to avoid it as much as possible. And it has been happening in the past five years. So it's, it has been a lot of investment, but before that, five years is nothing in comparison with the age of the university, 200 years. So development is a continuous thing, and when you're in it, maybe you don't see it. But if I organize an open, soft, open source soft, uh, open hardware uh, conference in my university, not so many people show up. So, you know, celebrate your wins. That's partly because my university is not a technical university and we have a lot of different topics, but you have to pick people, you know, cookies and pizza, and we have, uh, I showed this Lily's Proto Lab. This is, a, this is a facility we have started, very small facility for encouraging uh, prototyping uh, and open science, and people don't come there because of open science. They come because they wanted to, you know, to build something nice or build something for the Christmas tree or, uh, you know, have something for the projects, which is nicer. So only few students come just because of the philosophy of open science. They are not interested. If my course was not obligatory, students would have not taken it, and they take it to my face, and I understand it. So I guess uh, there is a lot of consensus of the purpose of science which we do, right? But we have come from different backgrounds, we have different boundary conditions, and there is a lot of ambivalence. Right? There is a lot of not complete conviction that this is the way to go for science because people have different restrictions. The dean has different restrictions, the head of department, the teacher, the student has different restrictions. For the ambivalent people, and I don't think more than maybe 5% are really against open science. Right? They say, is open science is nice, but will it bring bread on my table or will it bring me students? So for those people, it's very important to approach it, in my view, from the view of curiosity. You know, you talk to them and say, well, what is common between us? Uh, you don't like open access, you don't want to pay for it, you don't want to you know, have a course, in, but maybe you do like you know, access to other people. You, know, you would like data. Do you like NASA? Do you like CERN? Do you like the big names? Do you like the Nobel Prize or whatever? That is common, and then from that moment of common interest, you can always find something which is in the interest of both. Right? Maybe when I say to my students, yeah, open science, no. If I say NASA is doing open science or CERN is doing open science, oh, tell me more about it. So one has to find these common grounds. And this is about all the fields which do need this transition to society. You have, you have a lot of ambivalent people because people are working in habit. As a social creature, you would like to do the thing which is, first of all, easy, and the second is common. People do not want to do difficult things which are uncommon. This is like, you know, being vegetarian. Yesterday I went to, to go buy food and there was a restaurant saying, you know, can I help you? Say, yeah, do you have vegetarian? No, I don't, right? This, this is not common, so it's very difficult. If you, on one side, make it easy for people to do the thing you would like to be for the common good from the other side also, make it more common, then very slowly things come. This is, uh, very long answer, it's not very concrete, I understand, but l try to focus on the common, common thing. Just, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. We, we have the community and uh, we, we are managing to push some things, but every time we, uh, try, we are trying to involve the top-down approach, it fails, and then we We've ju we are just making some decisions these days and organizing some stuff that are purely based on bottom-up, and we are not really hoping <laughs> for any other kind of support. So thank you. It, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it makes it easier for us now. We, we don't feel frustrated because, yeah, it depends on the people and the community, and uh, yeah, the others will join later. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Stanley. I appreciate your presentation and your insights, and I especially like open hardware handshake. 
-hmm. that you presented, and it's basically basically recycling ideas that we have. Maybe not every idea is going to be a product in, in the end, but they can be recycled and build upon that. So yeah. there is a greater even um, um, a greater impact that I see in, in that. I, I believe Creative Commons are just a sample license, but it can be used any free software or open hardware license. That, that was one of the comments. The, the other comment I wanted to, to add is, uh, in my experience, using open hardware in education at courses gives students much more insight in things, uh, in, in the fact how instruments function which you cannot learn by proprietary har hardware. So th there's maybe connection between research and, and education pillar that you presented. And uh, the, the question in the end, um, I read about proposals to not use, um, to, to not uh, apply for grants for funding, but instead for uh, states and, and different funders to make lottery. And there Make is even a pilot lottery. Lottery, yeah, yeah. Lottery, not to waste time in preparing <laughs> proposals, but just a simple idea. Uh, idea goes into first review stage, and n not just to, to fund perpetual mobile or something like mm -hmm. that. And then uh, it's out of the box lottery. And I know some pilots in Australia where they tried lottery uh, for funding research. And I wanted to know what do you think about that, mm -hmm. because I saw that you also know the pain point of. of research in, in, in funding. Yeah, so three points. So on the first point of, uh, of the companies, believe me when I say, we have a lot of collaboration with ASML, and ASML is the chip making company or chip making machine making company, the lithography machines. We do a lot of collaborations with them, and this is a, I think it's a myth that the companies are interested in technology at the universities, because afterwards they have to spend 10 years uh, redo everything from scratch to actually do it. What the companies are interested mostly in are people. And they just directly tell us, you know, ASML has you know, 2,000 vacancies per year for physics graduates. Uh, we just don't, cannot create them. They have to build houses for them because it's growing so fast. So that's where I would say, why they support all these tech transfer offices is not just for the technology which eventually become obsolete or not, or become you know, the next iPhone or not. It's because they can identify people who really do true things. And if the licenses that come out are put on the shelf, these people will forever lose their vis visibility. So even, not even giving them money, but giving them visibility because you did part of this trajectory and here is the outcome, it's such a big gift for the company and for the people who go through this trajectory that even surpasses the value of, uh, of eventual promise of that future iPhone technology. So that's, that's something we should not forget and people are much more valuable, trained people, good skilled people are much more valuable and they have to show it. Creating communities also of course is one way of having access to, to people. Right? In the open science community or open hardware community, people have so many projects, you have a hard time convince them to take another project. So the, the projects are uh, taking very long time. That was number one. Uh, then the second one. Uh, oh, learning instruments. Of course, it's of course much more fun. Uh, my colleague at the Lilly's Portal Lab, Leonard Heller, he could get the Arduinos, but he starts with components, and then he asks people to solder the Arduino. And he says, and there's a lot of value in soldering your own chip because you understand what is going into the electronics, which is much more valuable than just you know, programming it or using it. And there are a lot of things we have forgotten. We used to be uh, you know, a faculty or a group of very handy people. But nowadays, I have students which sort of are scared of one volt because they are always told, you know, electricity is dangerous. So, and the difference between 220 AC and one volt DC is not being sort of very obvious. So, one has to give practical issues, uh, practical teaching, and that's definitely much easier to do. On the lottery of the grants, that's I have a bit of maybe odd topic among colleagues. I understand it's very hot topic of talking about grants. Uh, but I'm just wondering, coming out of Iran, which, you know, the research budget is one hundredth of the Netherlands, and even maybe much smaller than here, I'm sometimes surprised people complain that we need more money. 
um, yeah, well, it would be nice to have more money, but maybe you need smaller grants. Maybe you need more collaborations. Maybe you need multi-stage grants. So I understand that if you really have to spend, you know, packages of one million and only have 10 million to distribute and 1,000 applicants, then definitely lottery is a better way. But maybe packaging it into smaller parts so that you have for everyone something to do and doing it in stages is even a smarter idea. So I'm a bit sort of on the line, uh, on the fence for the idea of lottery. Although I appreciate it when it must. Then, I mean, but that, when it must come to lottery, it means that the management has failed to come with a smarter idea. <laughs> Funding. Crowdfunding. Yes, uh, crowdfunding for science works. Actually, it's not such a bad idea, but then you really have to go back to the origin of why you do it, right? It's, uh, if you want to crowdfund, you either have to come with something very flashy that everybody wants or something which uh, enacts consumerism. Maybe you don't want that, you know, another fancy clog, another fancy dress. But if you want to make science work for, based on public funding, then you have to come with the science that works for the public. The average, you know, street cleaner or shopkeeper doesn't, you know, just support science for, uh, for the sake of science. They pay taxes because if they don't, they go to jail. So one has to come with a very compelling reason of why this will change the life of the people who are going to support it. I was hoping that there are students who also ask that. No pressure. Perhaps I will uh, have one question that might be interesting for students. Yeah, go ahead. It's a little bit personal because, uh, well, you'll hear. Uh, it is interesting that I heard from your talk that uh, you said you can recognize yourself in both quarters, 1% quarter and common quarters. Mm -hmm. and let's assume for a moment that our technology students have some good idea. Mm -hmm. What would be your criteria to either take a go with mm -hmm. the patents yeah. or share yeah. it with yeah. everyone. So yeah. how would you decide perhaps that could help them if they have something new, yeah. what to pursue? Yes, I have done patents and I have done spin-offs and I, I understand that. Uh, so if you have a technology which the market is not there, you have to create the market like a new diagnostic tool for the you know, point of care research or uh, I don't know, a new medicine, or you have a very large trajectory which is enforced by law. And this method that we have here is actually came from the pharmaceutical industry, and that's just directly copied to the rest of the university. And that has a trajectory of 20 years, food industry the same. So some of those areas, then actually if you really need a lot of money immediately, and it has to be patient for 10 years, 20 years, then yes, go, go to the path of the patents. But this is usually a minority of ideas, uh, which is highly risky. But if you have that, it's possible. It depends also about how, what kind of person you are. Uh, you have to also be extremely patient and uh, you know, take a lot of risk to, to do that. Some people are driven by that. Uh, I have nothing against it. But to try to enforce everything that come out of the lab that maybe this would be next, I found this is very naive. I don't think this is the case. For the other side, I mean, crowdfunding you mentioned, the technologies, I have these five criteria, which I personally will apply, and actually now even apply to choose my next research topic, because I do want to stay in the commons quarter. I have been enough in the other quarter. Uh, I just don't do research, which I know only 10 people in the world will need it. I finished the research I have now, which 10 people in the world need it, but I will not start a new project. Excellent. Thank you very much. And do we have more questions? Suddenly ask about the students. <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to give a students' uh, perspective. Um, one of our, our professors, uh, Predark Pejovic, uh, who was, I think, a uh, member of the committee, uh, during uh, my bachelor studies, I used to go to his lectures, and he was a great supporter of, he's a great supporter of open source software and hardware. 
during his lectures, he would always uh, take the time to share some new link or some new resource for open source hardware or YouTube channel, something like that. So do you think that exposing students mm, always to these kind of ideas during uh, the course of three years of bachelor studies or four years can make uh, uh, maybe a new impact to the mm. students? Yeah. It's interesting that you say uh, about exposing. So this is, comes from another angle, I think. So I don't know about Serbia, but in the Netherlands, it's now very good understanding that study has become very stressful. So there's a lot of stress combined with the studies. Uh, again, I, I at the same time understand and don't understand because it's a very wealthy country, but it's also a lot of uh, emphasis on, on results. So I, I try to feed, go back a little bit about, of course, you say examples, but I think it's very useful if we think about the role of play and playing in studying. So we now have terms like challenge-based learning or project-based learning, which is sort of coming uh, to, the, to the courses and people can actually learn by doing the challenge also in the elementary school, mid, uh, middle school and the university. I personally think, of course, these are very nice. You know, this is the, the YouTube, the nice things, the stories, games, all these things are very well suited for, for transferring knowledge to people and then pe keeping people engaged. At the end, it's about the process of learning. And I would advise all teachers to think about their you know, youth and playful times and uh, find playful ways of teaching. Yet you can just play and purposefully play. I have a colleague in the geosciences, they use in the, ro in the role of real games, how we can actually use games uh, to talk about extremely difficult things. You know, playing with trouble is the project they have. And they have a resource of 10, uh, sorry, 100 games that they have collected, card games, but also uh, role play games that they use for discussing very difficult issues. So trying to use play in general, and maybe video is one way of doing it, but something which is fun in the process is of course has an extremely high uh, teaching value. And it's not about reaching the goal immediately, it's about learning about the process of learning. So that would be my general recommendation to not forget about it. I'll tell you something, uh, maybe it works for attracting your dean. So when we wanted to have uh, the opening of the uh, the Proto Lab last year, uh, we wanted to invite everybody. And you know, our uh, vice chancellor is from the legal uh, sort of bachelor. He has never been into a technical lab. So we thought, how are we going to invite these sort of people who maybe are not very much connected to technique? And we made a game. So we put the uh, invitation in a, in a puzzle, a 3D puzzle, which you have to spend about 10 minutes uh, to open it to see the invitation. And all of them came. You know, invited the board, and all of them came to the opening. Uh, most of them gave the game to the kids to, to solve it uh, for them. But this is, you know, everybody wants to play. Everybody likes games, and so be playful about it. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Yeah. Let's give him one round of applause. Thank you very much. It was great.